welcome to Rock Tales, the forum where uh, famous people from the industry, we get together, uh, we anecdote, we tell things that, that have happened in the past, not the future, just the past. And it's really, we're there for the over 50s um, and people who are just our, our kids of, of, of all ages. Uh, may I pass you over now to, to our, our host, uh, the, the Venerable Mr. Nick Carpenter. Venerable. Wow. You might consider yourself past, everybody. Uh, hello there. Yeah, Rock Tales here on Manic TV. Uh, industry friends and colleagues uh, are here. They join us here to share scurrilous stories. Uh, and today we have another transatlantic edition with our three guests joining us from the good old US of A. As I always say when we introduce these things, rather than industry veterans, uh, these days record labels would uh, politely call them uh, heritage artists, I think. Uh, so, gents, we're after your very best anecdotes. Um, uh, so, Steve, would you like to uh, introduce uh, the guys? Indeed, uh, from left to right, in no, in in order of age. Uh, can, can we go? First of all, the incredibly old but uh, youthful looking Mr. Ali Score, drummer with a flock of seagulls, uh, now residing in Florida. And Ali, it's a little bit hot there, is it? Hi there, first of all. But yeah, it's it's hot here. It's Florida, so I expect it to be hot, and I want it to be hot. So, uh, but I'm glad to be with these esteemed colleagues. You you mad fool. Uh, talking of steamed, Nigel Dick, you steamed quite a bit. Tell us where you are in the jolly old USA. I am in Golden, Colorado. Uh, very sunny and hot today, but very dry rather than soggy and damp where uh, Al is in Florida. Yeah. And Nigel, we know you, of course, in the you're a, a, not really an 80s child because you're still more than active. But how many videos did you direct and produce, do you reckon, in the 80s, rough, roughly? In the 80s, all I can tell you is I'm at 399. So the next video I do will be number 400. Oh, that's quite a lot. Yes. OK. A lot um, of yeah. Yeah, well, uh, seasoned though you are, you're looking uh, as youthful as ever, Nigel. It's lo lovely to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, from you. youthful to someone who's really getting on a bit, uh, who's, um, I'm surprised he's still with us, to be honest, is Brian Chatton. Brian, welcome. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> right, yes, Brian Chatton. That's right, yes. And mm -hmm. how do you describe yourself, Brian? I've known you all my life. You're a keyboard player extraordinaire. You've worked with most of the people in the industry. Um, what, what are you, a composer, a decomposer, a, a keyboard player? What are you? Uh, a permanent pain in the ass, according to all the ladies over here. Oh, uh, oh no, did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that, did I? Anyway, uh, I, I just wrote my autobiography so I could add author to uh, Buggery Expert. <laughs> Uh, musician, uh, songwriter, probably is, is where I've uh, really made my uh, $36. Uh, but, you know, I play cheese boards, you know that. That's my yeah. uh, love. Yeah. Well, well done, Brian. And so very nice to have you all stateside. Um, Nick Carpenter, so over to you for that, that, that trembly first question. Nick? Well, welcome, one and all. Uh, yeah, the first question, we usually kick things off by asking everyone about their musical heroes. Even though everyone here has worked in the music industry for many, many years, I'm sure when we were growing up, we had musical heroes of our own and people we aspired to. And I wonder uh, which of you have met your musical heroes over the years or, or even worked with them. And if you did, did they meet your expectations? Did they live up to uh, to how you thought they would be? I don't know who wants to kick off with this one. Hmm. I can. Um, I can. I'm, Ali, Al. Yeah, why not? Um, when we first, my brother and I, we, you know, we when we, we were raised together, obviously, and what used to happen was Mike used to put the radio under his pillow to listen to a radio station. You know, we were about 12 at the time, 13, something like that. And he would put the radio under the cushion and we'd both listen to it when we're supposed to be going to sleep. But when Wishbone Ash came on, we would take that pillow off, we would blast it in the middle of the night. And, um, and I always remember the song The Phoenix. 
And that was our favorite. I mean, we used to love that song. Well, anyway, once, once the flock of seagulls got going, um, we actually got to meet Ted Turner. who And uh, he was recording a demo with us. And uh, I always remember this because, uh, you know, we had the track pretty much worked out um, 90, 90%. And we were going to record it like that. Well, Ted Turner didn't like my drumming. <laughs> So he said, he said, take this bit out, take this bit out, take this bit out. And I was left with bum tish, bum tish. <laughs> it's like, and that, that was one of my heroes. So it's like, I, was, oh, I don't no. know. We haven't had that before, where, where somebody's actually been criticised, critiqued by the... <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But, you know, but he was, he was a hero. So I was like, okay, I'll do whatever you say, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's funny, right, Alan, so did, did that sort of put you off? No, 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 no. I mean, if you're in music business, you can't be put off by anything, I don't think. But um, it was it was definitely something I, I remembered. <laughs> so, and my other hero, I've always uh, hero worshipped Alice Cooper. And that seems strange given my musical background. But, you know, I was just uh, um, enamored by Alice Cooper when he first was on the, the old Grey Whistle Test. And uh, since then, I've never got to meet him, though. I want to meet him. Hopefully this will help. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 well I'm, I'm semi-related to Alice, if you didn't know that, Ali, uh, I, in a weird, weird, weird way. But, uh, but anyway, I can't engineer it because he's off on other planets. But, uh, uh, but, but, Ali, bless you. What about yourself, Brian Chatton? You've, you've worked with the Meat Loafs and the Phil Collins and God knows who. But, I mean, did they disappoint you? Or were, I knew you've worked with B.B. King, for God's sake. I mean... These people, uh, were there anyone they that disappointed you at they all? They worked with me, for sake. They, they worked work with me. you. Sorry, Brian. Right. What, what about you when you met these guys? Any immediate it, stuff? I, it, it used to be Russ Conway. <laughs> and, until I found out he had two fingers missing, and I thought, bloody hell. Then I kind of said, how can he play like that with Two fingers missing. So I then went on from him to an obvious person, Keith Emerson. Uh, Keith, I used to watch at the Marquee Club and, of course, just completely floored me. I couldn't believe this guy. He was incredible. And then I'd go to the, um, to the uh, oh, Jesus Christ, what's it called? Jack Barry's Club, La Chasse Club. I don't know whether you guys know about that one, but four days up, four doors up from the marquee, and he'd walk in. There was it was only room for twenty people, and I'd be standing next to Keith, and couldn't find my mouth, not for nothing. I'd be trembling, shaking next to him, and lo and behold, I joined Lee Jackson for Jackson Heights, and who came along and watched me. <laughs> I, it's a good job I was wearing brown trow with <laughs> and he'd be right there in the front row and I swear to God honestly he'd stand up and applaud at the end of the show so anyway I got to know him well and he said uh, he, he said why don't you come and live at our place in the the flat apartment an 11 room mansion right opposite um, uh, Olympia so I thought about it and I said, yes. Uh, and we all moved in, his family and my family shared this 11 room. And then we'd go to Stonehill where um, <clears throat> Lewis Carroll used to own it. And he, he bought it. And it, it, it's said to be the most beautiful uh, house in the British Isles. But I, I can see it because it's like a Hansel and Gretel cottage. You could like break a bit up. I had some wonderful times there. there a lot of people that show up, you know, uh, Daltrey and um, Alvin Lee was a, a big, uh, he'd come and we'd be clay pigeon shooting. One day we had a, a transvestite table tennis game, Keith and I, but you'll have to read my book for that one. <laughs> wow. Well, I, 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 mean, I mean, this is, you've got a lot to live up to here, Nigel, because I mean, Al... <laughs> Al was criticised by his hero. Brian actually moved in with his. So, um... <laughs> um, well, I can respond that I have worked with Alice Cooper, who's a lovely guy. Al, you'll be oh. happy to know. It, probably one of the most professional people I've worked with, actually. Um, and um, 
I once had my picture taken with Alvin Lee from 10 years after, but the, um, I've been very lucky and worked with many of my heroes, but the first big hero I got to work with was before I started directing was with Robert Plant. And uh, I was still producing at the time for my director. And we went over to have a meeting with Robert in this very she-she hotel around the back of Shepherd's Bush. Um, and uh, I was completely in awe of meeting the golden God who was, who was very pleasant. We talked about what was gonna happen in the video that we were gonna make and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just sitting in the corner quietly taking notes. And then he said, uh, as the meeting finished, it was like six o'clock in the evening. He says, um, where are you guys going now? And we were all going back to Camden Town. And he said, could you give me a lift? Could you give us a lift to, uh, I, I'm, I'm going, going up the West End. Can you drop me off in the West End? Because I'll never get a cab at this time. And we all looked at each other because there was three of us, my boss, Robbo, who was a director, the art director, Simon from Stiff, who was also a drummer in his spare time. So we were in his van, which had no seats in the back. It only had one seat, which was the driver's seat. And we all looked at each other rather nervously and we're going, this is a man who's not only used to flying around first class in fabulous jets, but had his own private jet for flying around America. And we've got an old transit van with no, with nothing in the back, there's no seats. So we said, well, uh, you know, we all ummed and erred and said, the problem is the van has no seats. And he stood up and he said, and he put his hands on his hips and he says, guys, I was in a band in Birmingham and I drove to London and back every other night in the back of a transit with a bunch of martial amps. You think I've never done this before? Let's go. Right. So we climbed in the back of the transit and there he was sliding around the back as we went round Shepherd's Bush roundabout. And um, I've never forgotten it. I just thought it was a great example of somebody who'd had tremendous success and enormous wealth and you know without being too ridiculous about it was just one of the lads and yeah. uh, I, I was in, incredibly impressed and have met some people since who had a tenth of his success and had 15 times the ego and it was a great lesson that's a lovely story